Thank you. It's, it's really a, a terrific to be here, and, and uh, thanks, John Duda, particularly for organizing this. I'm, I'm delighted to be, be here. Um, I was listening to, I was listening to Jamie and, uh, and also about Red Emma's, w wondering how best to tell you about what we've been doing both at the Democracy Collapse, co Democracy Cannot Collapse, with the Collaborative, and also in terms of the work we've been doing around the country, but more a, a perspective on how do we think about this stuff? And what, what does it matter that we have a B Corps or something like Red Emma's that's attempting, is a business trying to do something? What does that mean? Is it significant and what, how do we look at this? And I'm, I'm not a government official, I was a former government, I used to run House and Senate staffs when, in an earlier period of my life uh, and when I fell away from that church. But, uh, so I'm kind of a realist in that sense. And let me suggest to you the possibility, and that's a funny word, to hold it as a possibility that we are seeing the emergence slowly in our own time in history of the precondition for a transformation of the entire system. And that that's what this is about, these little experiments. And there are a lot more of them going on. Now, most people, you know, I suspect in this audience like the concept of changing the system. There's language about anti-capitalism. If you don't like capitalism, I often say, if you don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, what do you really want? and people, I think, respond to that question in this kind of a group. But I also think a lot of people think, mm, yeah, it'd be great to do, but you know, this is the most powerful corporate capitalist system in the history of the world. What are you really talking about? And I'm suggesting the possibility to hold it that way, that we are actually seeing, not only in these experiments, but the beginning points of a serious possibility of a radical transformation. Now, you have to remember, I'm a historian, so when I say that, I think of decades of developmental processes and dynamics over time. But it always comes back to what do we do, the person in your seat, my seat, because we're all part of this process. So one way to think about it is, is as follows. We've been tracking at the Democracy Collaborative various forms of this kind of development. Now, on the one hand, you can start with a picture of what now exists. The number that I think clarifies it for me is, and I checked this number several times before I believed it, the top 400 individuals, people, 400 people, not many more than exist in this room right now, have more wealth now than the bottom 160 million people. Let that sink in. That's the bottom 60% of society. So that's a medieval number, and I don't mean that rhetorically. Medieval society was organized with high concentrations of wealth, and the peasantry had very little. There were actually obligations between feudal lords and peasants, which we don't, the obligations are shredding in this society. But to think that the power structure is that concentrated and that that has to change suggests ultimately that if you want to change things, one of the things that has to happen is you have to change and transform who owns capital and how you democratize the ownership of wealth. And if you don't do that, they win. So one piece of the puzzle, and we'll get to big corporations shortly, one piece of the puzzle is how do you begin to understand and build in everyday life the idea, simply the idea and experience that there are other ways in real life to organize production, distribution, wealth that are dem democratic forms. How can that be an idea rather than an abstraction, rather than a slogan, rather than rhetoric? How does that become possible in a society slowly over time building up so that people take it for granted that democratic forms of ownership are in the natural and the right way to proceed as counterposed to concentrated power ownership. How does that happen? One of the ways it's happening, and this is what we've been tracking, is out of their own experience, people are beginning to develop, we have been 
the press doesn't cover this, but if you look deeply, you can find it, and I'll mention a website, community-wealth, put the dash in. We survey that sort of thing. There are, in America today, probably more, more people, something like three million more people that work in worker-owned companies that are members of unions in the private sector. You probably didn't know that because the press doesn't cover that. There are 10,000 such companies, some good, some bad, some improving, some getting really interesting, some unionized, some not. But there are 10,000 and about 10 million people work in them. That's a democratic form of owning capital in ordinary American life. There are 140 million Americans, even now, members of co-ops and co-op credit unions. One person, one vote, ownership of wealth. Just very conventional, and there it is in American experience. There are four or five, 4,500, maybe 5,000 neighborhood-owned corporations, nonprofits that make money or try to make money to support community efforts. There are several hundred really interesting democratic co-ops, worker co-ops. There are different forms, one person, one, one vote, co-op, worker-owned firms, slightly different from other kinds of worker-owned firms. There are 17 states now considering legislation to, to set up state-owned banks, like the Bank of North Dakota. Bank of North Dakota is now 90, over 90 years old, and it is a state-owned socialist bank in the middle of America, operates efficiently, effectively, has the support of farmers and small business people, and there it is, right there. And 17 states are considering legislation to do more of that in their own state. 18 states have now, are now looking at legislation to set up single-payer health care. Single-payer health care, by the way, is a socialized form of insurance. That's what Medicare is. Medicare is, Medicare is socialized insurance. It's as if you had an insurance company called Medicare that was owned by the government, and that's what it is. And so is single-payer health care. We get confused about this. But notice what happens also, because I want to give you a sense of the progression here. If you think carefully about Medicare or the many states trying to set up single-payer I think we're going to have single payer one way or another, no matter what happens with the courts. And we'll come back to that. The, pro the cost pressures are too big, they can't be solved. But over time, I think that's going to happen. But think about this. If you have a social owned health care insurance, that's not socialized medicine, that's a whole other thing. This is social insurance. It displaces private insurance. The insurance companies don't have that business. And to the extent one state or another state, Massachusetts is not one, but Vermont will be shortly, moves into public-owned health care insurance that displaces and moves back corporate-owned insurance. And similarly, in virtually all the areas we're talking about, many, many cities now are talking about either setting up city banks or using their deposits to fund credit unions that will help local community groups, co-ops, and small businesses. Cities have a lot of money. And where do they put it? Usually in the Bank of America in California, they're now considering setting up a city-owned bank or a credit union or a different form of public bank that will fund community enterprises. I'm trying to give you a sense of, and that website will give you more of this, there is something happening for the first time in my life and probably yours, that is about changing literally the ownership of wealth and capital in America. Not abstractly, but in pragmatic places, step by step around the country, the principles are usually community-based. Some of them are modest, like the B Corps, but it moves in a different direction. Some are radical, like setting up state banks and displacing other banks. Some of them are hesitant, difficult, some of them, many of them will lose, but there is something a brewing that is very different from the model of change that at least I was brought up with, uh, and it has an institutional thrust. Most of the pr progressive history of the modern American progressive history, the way I read it, and I think a lot of political scientists do, 
had to do with a model of the system. How do you organize a big system, an economic system? The way we've done it for most of the 20th century and still try to do is you let the big corporations own the capital, you let them run the game, and then you design a system where you try to use, not displacing, slowly pushing them back, you try to regulate them. You let them have the action and you try to regulate them, the banks, the insurance companies, or you try to tax them, or you try to, in, quote, incentivize them. Those models allow them to keep the power and you hope to be able to fence them in and get some good things done. That model in America, we call it liberalism. I come out of the liberal tradition. I'm from the Wisconsin form of the liberal tradition, the progressive Wisconsin form. That's called liberalism in America. It's called social democracy in Europe, that model. The model that we're talking about is a little different. It talks about actually transforming them step by step and moving them aside to expand the area in which democratic ownership becomes the paradigm, particularly the kind that starts at the bottom up and moves upward. That's a different model. And one of the reasons I suggest you might want to think about these experiments, including B Corps, for instance, and including the state banks, and including the healthcare systems, as beginning to open a whole new venture and a whole new vision, is that it is not only different and moving forward, but the old system is dying. The old model, the traditional model that I came out of, I used to run Gaylord, for some of you environmentalists, Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, I was his legislative director at one point. That model worked for a while. It depended in all cases, in the United States and in Europe, it depended on the strength of labor unions to give the muscle to progressive politics to fence in and regulate the corporations. And that muscle has collapsed over time from 34% of the labor force to 11% to 7% in the private sector. That's one of the reasons why the corporate power has grown and is no longer fenced in, why you can't regulate the banks. The muscle of the institutional muscle is declining. So one way to think about what I'm talking about is there is a decaying process of one system, corporations regulated and fenced in, and the possibility, I use that word carefully, and the possibility of slowly evolving a different principle, the democratization, literally, and the ownership of wealth and the buildup of institutions, step by step by step, that begin slowly to displace that old system. Maybe. Now, I'm a realist. I don't take this stuff as utopian, so let me suggest to you why I personally think the odds are not totally against us. For one thing, the kind of things that are happening at the state and local level in many parts of the country, and Wisconsin in particular, are not simply coming out of people who want to do nice things. They are being driven by pain. They are being driven by intense pain and failure of the old system. The decay before your eyes is forcing people to try new things that they don't want to try. It's hard to do this kind of stuff. But there aren't answers from the traditional system. And to the extent that context continues, and my suggestion to you is in part because of the decline of the old model, the likelihood of stalemate, political as well as economic, of stagnation, of pain, and of an awareness, notice this, Something's wrong. People sense there is a profound something wrong. The Occupy movement had a tremendous response. I take my hat off to the Occupy movement. But the reason it had a response is because millions of people knew they were talking about something that they felt. That's a big deal in history when millions of people sense something profoundly wrong is wrong. And they begin looking for new handholds on where to move forward. So new models building up, new pain, and I would suggest to you a likelihood of ongoing stagnation and ongoing pain. I don't think they can solve this problem. I don't think you can elect a Democrat who can make it work. 
I also don't think it's going to collapse. In 1929, the government was 11% of the GDP. It's 34% now, depending upon where the GDP denominator is. That means it can sag, it can decay, it can stagnate, but you probably won't get a big collapse which will bring in either the left or maybe the right. But now think about it. A decaying context in which people increasingly see and feel that something is wrong, that era of history, our time in history, I suggest, is a time when more and more people sense something's wrong, and since there aren't answers, they are forced to create answers or the pain continues. That's what's happening with these new models. They are not magical. They're coming out of that context. And my suggestion to you is that context is the context that is ongoing and likely to continue and likely to open the way for those who want to. By the way, I'm speaking to people who want to do this. Those who want to can create elements slowly, piece by piece, of the next systemic model in our own communities. It is, in fact, being done all over the country, as you'll see from the website or the kind of writings that people are doing. This stuff is happening everywhere because people sense it. Now, that's one process. Changing the entire system is a different process. This is prehistory. I'm from Wisconsin. A lot of the history before the New Deal, 30 years before the New Deal, the models that became the legislation at the national level were, quote, developed in the laboratories of democracy, the states and localities. That's still a very important point. The principles that people begin to learn in these models, viewing it as a historian or a political economist, are critical only if they move to larger levels. But that's a process over time, and I think a very important and likely process. There is, in fact, some national legislation being developed in certain areas, and I'll tell you about one model about that. There is also another model, which some of you may have noticed happening, but it, everyone's forgotten this. It's really interesting. Uh, what do you do about big corporations? Well, one piece of the puzzle uh, we tend to have forgotten is that we nationalized General Motors and Chrysler. Did you notice? And do you think it's the last time these big corporations are going to go down? The, build, the likelihood of further nationalizations, in my view, given the economic crisis, is high. And there will be bailouts of the old form, for sure, until the new principles may just possibly become the basis of saying, why is it that the taxpayer bails these guys out, they start making profits, and then the profits go to private owners? Something is wrong with this picture. Possibly over time, I think, probably over time, if these models continue to generate as obvious common sense in ordinary life, a different principle, people will be saying, you know, why shouldn't we build the next mass transit and rail system through the next General Motors that the people already own it? Also, notice they did it as a worker national ownership structure. The VEBA structure gives you not just nationalization, but a nationalization with the UAW of partial ownership in both cases complex and I would do it in a different way, but they've begun to offer that model because of crisis. The banking system also may have, you may have noticed, collapsed. And they nationalized it, but didn't take the power. They gave away the votes and put trillions of dollars into the system and then gave it back. It will go down again. I don't know a financial expert, conservative, liberal, or radical who thinks the system is stable and it will collapse again and they will bail it out, and people will see the game. And at some point, there are many Tea Party people who are saying, nationalize the bastards. What do you do about that phenomenon? My suggestion is there's a whole other line of, of development that can only lead at some point, if the processes evolve in this way, towards that question being a serious question for some of the large industries. And also, those of you who know anything about the healthcare system know that the cost problems are outrageously out of, out of control. And <laughs> we've been talking, we've been doing a study of efficiency because they all, the claim is that private enterprise is efficient. The healthcare system wastes a trillion dollars a year compared with comparable systems. It, it is 
roughly 20%, it's moving towards 20%, it's about 18% of the GDP. Other countries are doing it at 10% or 9% and getting better results. This is not efficiency. This is corporate ripoff. But at a, at a level that is so massive that we stop to, you can't even get your head around it. There are trillions, not millions, being wasted by this system. And some of the big corporations that are in international trade also are up against it because they have to pay for this stuff in international competition. They're not so allied with the insurance companies. And some of the hospitals are not so allied with the insurance companies. And some of the pharmaceutical guys are not so allied with the. There is a buildup in that sector. Over time, this is a different process, which is forcing the question of, this thing is crazy. We've got to rationalize it. And the insurance companies are fighting back intensely. They're winning right now. But I do not think they will win inevitably. And I think a state-by-state -state process may open that dimension. Now, I just suggested something to you. I didn't mean to talk this long, but it, you know, Daphne said, talk a little longer. I've got a short visit talk. Uh, I just suggested something. I just wanted to notice kind of, I just threw something out kind of whimsically. It may be that some of the big corporations will do what we have already done. General Motors and Chrysler were nationalized. And there will be more crisis. The banking system was de facto nationalized. And there will be more crisis. The healthcare system is in profound crisis and the pain levels will grow and people will be thrown out of hospitals onto the street and the public will be more and more angry and people will be displaced. And that system is in crisis at a totally different level. So there is another set of processes emerging which pose the question of how do you own the capital? Public banks, single payer healthcare, maybe someday broader systems, maybe the mass transit and rails, down the line, not simply because of the slow buildup of different understanding that we're talking about here, but maybe out there because the crisis problems are also growing. So let it linger there. Just possibly, we live in a period where this is beginning to open up and we're not quite hip yet that it is a real possibility rather than a radical fantasy. Now, I'm a realist. It is possible that the United States will decay period, like Rome, decay, and decay, and more decay, and just decay. It's possible that these pain levels will generate a real right-wing reaction, we'll get fascism. It's possible that these kinds of things will just end up being good things that help people in local communities. My suggestion to you is any way you cut it, the answer comes down, let's push this process as hard as we can. We will either simply help folks in community after community after community by the new building, or we will help bolster a decaying liberal process by building new institutions that give more power that the labor unions are declining away from, and that's useful. Or just possibly, we will be laying the foundations slowly, steadily, in the prehistory of the next great transformation. So any way you look at it, changing the name of who owns that capital, altering the principles, and learning it in everyday life in communities, not in just abstract rhetoric, and building from there seems to be a useful thing to do. More than that, it may very well be a historic thing to do by people like us who gather in places like this. Thank you very much.